Yes, we're live. Okay, it worked. I didn't do all that smiling and hand rubbing for nothing, you know, because that would have not been worth it. Hello, everyone. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and we're here to celebrate as well as go over the legal ramifications of what's going on with the YouTube DL repository. Let me close all of my windows here and get you over to here. Here it is back up already. Not that it was ever really that far gone because the repository, there's some kind of bug in GitHub where you can attach repositories to other repositories. And so YouTube DL actually showed up in the DMCA repository on GitHub after somebody did that. So kudos for that. But no, tonight we're gonna talk about the DMCA response the, the, I don't even know if there was a counter notification, but we're gonna talk about the response from GitHub and we're gonna talk about the response from the EFF. The EFF's response is shorter, it's only four pages, so let's talk about that first. That is here, also on GitHub. Uh, here, maybe I can post a link into the chat so anybody who wants to follow along can. And this is from Mitch Stoltz, senior attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Shout out to Mitch Stoltz. He helped me out a bunch of years ago when I was green in the past year and just getting started as an attorney. So really great guy. And I'm really happy to see every time that the EFF gets involved in one of these things, uh, like the uh, Jehovah's Witness subpoena to Reddit. Uh, the EFF, I believe, got involved, and so did uh, Joe Gratz from Dury Tangri representing Reddit. So also really cool. So this is November 15th, which is yesterday, and that's a Sunday, right? So they're working on a Sunday, working nice and hard for you. And this says, to the GitHub DMCA agent via email regarding the takedown of the YouTube-DL repository, dear GitHub, DMCA agent. The Electronic Frontier Foundation represents the current maintainers of the YouTube DL software utility, a free software project that uses GitHub as a home for development. As you are aware, GitHub disabled the YouTube DL repository in response to a demand from the RIAA, the Recording Industry Association of America, sent on September 21st, 2020. Oh, really? Was that... I said it was a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Holy mackerel. Has time just been creeping along or, or either that or moving that quickly? We write to thank GitHub for striving to protect the rights of free and open source software developers and to provide more information about YouTube DL to address the claims made in the RIAA's letter. First, YouTube DL does not infringe or encourage the infringement of any copyrighted works and its references to copyrighted songs in its unit tests are of fair use. I got that one right. It was just unit tests. Uh, thank you to the people who figured that out. But yeah, it appears that the three references to songs were actually just unit tests. Unit tests being tests that developers put into a piece of software and then you run a, a command. I, I'm familiar with it through Ruby on Rails and you run a test and then the unit test does something and then the result is also measured. And if the result has the you know, three elements or, or the correct response or something, then your unit test passes. And so you write a bunch of unit tests that are supposed to validate your software. And that's all it did. It pulled some data from YouTube. I don't even think it downloaded the the videos. It just pulled some data from YouTube and made sure that it matched a known response. Also, thank you to Count for your $2 donation. Thank you to Matthew East for your $5 donation. And thank you to Penny Whistle for your five pounds. UK here, but thanks to your channel, I've taken my old employer to court for refusing to pay me in lieu of a holiday when I left. Oh, I'm glad we made, we gave you that confidence. Um, let's see. Eldalen, thank you for the Swedish Kroner 50. Have a few bucks for the Pacer Fund. Unfortunately, it isn't possible to super chat the patron stream. Oh yeah, I have, I have monetization turned off for that. Let's continue. Similarly, true. Uh, first, YouTube deal does not infringe or encourage infringement and its tests are fair use. Nevertheless, YouTube DL's maintainers are replacing these references. Second, YouTube DL does not violate Section 1201 of the DMCA because it does not circumvent any technological protection measures on YouTube videos. 
Similarly, the signature or rolling cipher mechanism employed by YouTube does not prevent copying of videos. Below, we explain each of these points in more detail. It is our hope that upon consideration of this information, GitHub will reactivate the YouTube DL repository. YouTube DL is a command line utility for streaming and downloading user uploaded videos from various websites, including YouTube, first published in 2006, so it's been around for a while and they just decided to act now. That's a little bit disingenuous, huh? It has a vast, diverse, worldwide community of users. It is used by journalists and human rights organizations to save eyewitness videos, by educators to save videos for classroom use, by YouTubers to save backup copies of their own uploaded videos, and by users worldwide to watch videos on hardware that can't run a standard web browser, or to watch videos in their full resolution over slow or unreliable internet connections. One of the arguments was that it's used for time shifting, which isn't time shifting. Actually, this wasn't really an argument about YouTube DL. It was about another service. I think that was the Ute lawsuit, Y-O-U-T. And the big argument there, which we'll cover that in another video, but the big argument there was about time shifting. And I think they were making the argument from the Sony Betamax case back in the 1980s, I think it was, where the Supreme Court said that time shifting is okay. Now, I don't know if that's going to be the same thing on the internet, but time shifting on some level should be okay. YouTube DL stands in place of a web browser and performs a similar function with respect to user uploaded videos. Importantly, YouTube DL does not decrypt video streams that are encrypted with commercial DRM technologies such as Widevine that are used by subscription video sites like Netflix. So no bypassing of encryption means a much weaker circumvention of technological protection measures argument. Remember, the DMCA section 1201 has a anti-circumvention of technological protection measures provision. And so we read that to usually mean DRM technologies, but the law might not be so clear on how, what level of anti-circumvention technology you have to have. You don't have to have uncrackable DRM. It just has to be quote unquote effective. And I'm not exactly sure what that means. So really, if there is a locked door, you shouldn't be able to bypass the locked door. However, you're going to see the analogy here that if you knock on the door and YouTube opens the door and says, here's your video, that's not bypassing anti-circumvention provisions, that's call and answer, that's get request and response. The RIAA's letter refers to a single file of YouTube DL source code which references several copyrighted songs. This file contains series of automated tests that verify the functionality of YouTube DL for streaming various types of video. The YouTube DL source code does not, of course, contain copies of these songs or any others. And the presence of several copyrighted song links in a large series of such tests does not induce or encourage copyright infringement for several reasons. First, this file is not prominent as the RIAA contends. Yes, that was confusing. On our initial coverage of the issue, it seemed like the RIAA was saying that this was a marketing of the thing, and so it violated a specific provision of the DMCA that said you can't market a device or program meant to circumvent technological protection measures, or DRM. And then later on, we found out that it was just a unit test, not marketing at all. Second, the unit tests do not cause a permanent download or distribution of the songs they reference. They merely stream a few seconds of each song to verify the operation of YouTube DL, as a unit test does. Streaming a small portion of a song in a non-permanent fashion to test the operation of an independently created software program is a fair use. Saving a copy of the requested stream is only one function of YouTube DL, and YouTube DL does not distribute videos. Therefore, the unit tests do not suggest its use to copy and or distribute the referenced songs. The YouTube DL maintainers do not encourage the use of the tool to infringe copyright, nor do they market the tool for that purpose. While the presence of the automated tests referencing copyrighted songs in the YouTube DL code does not constitute infringement, the maintainers are replacing those lines with references to other videos that do not contain copyrighted music. We hope this will clear the way for GitHub to reactivate the repository. YouTube's signature code. 
For a subset of videos, YouTube employs a mechanism it calls a signature. Here is our understanding of how it works. When a user requests certain YouTube videos, YouTube's servers send a small JavaScript program to the user's browser embedded in the YouTube player page. That program calculates a number referred to as a SIG. That number then forms part of the URL, or Uniform Resource Locator, that the user's browser sends back to YouTube to request the actual video stream. This mechanism is completely visible to the user and simply uh, visible by simply viewing the source code of the player page. And I am an old school web developer. I'm not really up on all everything that's going on these days, but I tried. I tried to see what all the requests were going back and forth to a page here. So, you know, when you go to play, look, there is some sort of JSON, JSON key that goes back and forth here. I don't know if that's the key they're referring to, but yeah, a lot of that information is quite visible. The video stream is not encrypted, and no secret knowledge is required to access the video stream. JavaScript is a ubiquitous software technology found on millions of websites and understandable by numerous software programs. Any software capable of running JavaScript code can derive the URL of the video stream and access the stream, regardless of whether the software has been approved by YouTube. To borrow an analogy from literature, travelers come upon a door that has writing in a foreign language. When translated, the writing says, say friend and enter. The travelers say friend and the door opens. As with the writing on that door, YouTube presents instructions on accessing video streams to everyone who comes asking for it. YouTube DL works the same way as a browser when it encounters the signature mechanism. It reads and interprets the JavaScript program sent by YouTube, derives the signature value, and sends that value back to YouTube to initiate the video stream. YouTube DL contains no password, key, or other secret knowledge that is required to access YouTube videos. It simply uses the same mechanism that YouTube presents to each and every user who, who views the video. We presume that this signature code is what the RIAA refers to as a rolling cipher, although YouTube's JavaScript code does not contain this phrase. Regardless of what this mechanism is called, YouTube DL does not circumvent it, as the term is defined in section 1201A of the DMCA, because YouTube provides the means of accessing these video streams to anyone who requests them. As a federal appeals court recently ruled, one does not circumvent an access control by using a publicly available password. That's from the Data Drilling Data Systems v. Petrolink Services case from the Fifth Circuit in 2020, a case that I did not see in my research when I looked up a few major cases on this, so that's one we'll have to check out too. Circumvention is limited to actions that descramble, decrypt, avoid, bypass, remove, deactivate, or impair a technological measure without the authority of the copyright owner. What is missing from this statutory definition is any reference to use of a technological measure without the authority of the copyright owner. Because YouTube DL simply uses the signature code provided by YouTube in the same manner as any browser, rather than bypassing or avoiding it, it does not circumvent any alleged lack or and any alleged lack of authorization from YouTube or the RIAA is irrelevant. Lack of authorization might mean that it's a contract issue, a terms of service issue, and not a copyright issue. But there's some wiggle room in there. If you phrase your contract correctly, you might say that this contract is only effective for authorized users. And so it could be a copyright issue and not a terms of service issue, depending upon how the license agreement reads. But it seems more like it's a license agreement issue. Similarly, YouTube DL does not violate Section 1201B because the signature code does not prevent, restrict, or otherwise limit the exercise of a right of a copyright owner. In other words, the code does not prevent copying of YouTube data, or video, YouTube data, of video data. Any program capable of running JavaScript programs can run YouTube's signature code, regardless of whether it can also save a copy of the video streams it receives. The YouTube code is entirely different from the CSS encryption used on DVD discs and described in the Universal, Universal City Studios Inc. v. Corley case or from the Widevine DRM owned and used by YouTube's parent company, Google. 
Although I express no opinion here about how the DMCA might apply to these technologies, I note that both CSS and Widevine require licensed players containing secret keys, which are distributed only to technology vendors who agree to limit their use and maintain secrecy. In contrast, the YouTube signature code is distributed to all comers and contains no secrets. YouTube does not require web browser vendors to accept a license or commit to secrecy in order to use the signature code as it does with Widevine. The 2017 decision of the Hamburg or Hamburg Regional Court in Germany that the RIAA references, which, yeah, we all thought that was kind of weird. If there was some sort of strong US law against this, why is the RIAA referring to a Hamburg Regional Court in Germany decision? But here's how the EFF attacks that. That decision refers to YouTube's signature mechanism, and according to the EFF, was wrongly decided and is not binding, nor even persuasive under US law. And I can verify that, you know, you can cite outside decisions for their persuasion, but they're not binding in any way on the US, of course. The court in that case apparently reasoned that since the judge was not familiar with JavaScript, using the signature code was beyond the capabilities of the average user. It was on this basis that the court declared the code to be an effective technological measure under Germany's analog of Section 1201. The, so the DMCA was enacted in response to a intellectual property treaty, and everybody who is part of that treaty has some version of the DMCA. It won't be called the DMCA in other countries, but they will also have some kind of accommodation for fair use, some kind of accommodation for notice and takedown, some kind of accommodation for technological protection measures and copyright attribution, the things that were in the treaty. The court's analysis overlooks the ubiquity of JavaScript, which is embedded in every browser and similar software, making use of the signature mechanism well within the capabilities of the average user. The Hamburg court's analysis sweeps too broadly. It would cause anti-circumvention law to apply to any web content except the simplest plain text pages, because all such content can appear obscure to the average user in source code form, but is easily read and used in a browser. The Hamburg court's decision is not consistent with the US DMCA and would not be followed by a US court. In summary, YouTube DL does not violate either the Copyright Act or the DMCA. EFF and the YouTube DL maintainers thank GitHub for standing up for the rights of developers whose projects it hosts. Oh, and stand up they did. We're going to get to that in a moment. Stay tuned. We hope this explanation will allow you to restore the YouTube DL repository so that GitHub can continue to be the home for development of this popular and important tool. With appreciation, Mitch Stoltz, Senior Staff Attorney, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Big round of applause for Mitch Stoltz. Everybody go to the EFF and donate because they are a wonderful organization. They're very similar to the ACLU of the internet. So whereas the ACLU might stand up for your civil rights, the EFF does their best to stand up for your digital rights and they are a great organization and i highly recommend that you donate to them in fact i know that i have to re-up my membership and this reminds me to do that too let's turn now to github's response github has also stood up for the developers i, I first of all kind of like this uh icon uh, this um uh illustration here with the uh scales of justice in the background but here's what they have to say. November 16th, standing up for developers, YouTube DL is back. Today, oh, and this is Abby Vollmer. Today we reinstated YouTube DL, a popular project on GitHub, after we received additional information about the project that enabled us to reverse a DMCA takedown. At GitHub, our priority is supporting open source and the developer community, and so we share developers' frustration with this takedown, especially since this project has many legitimate purposes. Our actions were driven by processes required to comply with laws like the DMCA that put platforms like GitHub and the developers in a difficult spot.
and our reinstatement based on new information that showed the project was not circumventing a technological protection measure was in line with our values of putting developers first. We know developers want to understand what happened here and want to know how GitHub will stand up for developers and refine our processes on these issues. In this post, we provide answers to common questions about the DMCA and why GitHub handled this case the way we did, describe why circumvention claims deserve special treatment, and share how we're updating our policies and fighting to improve the law. Why did GitHub process this takedown in the first place? As a platform, we must comply with laws, even ones we don't think are fair for developers. As we've seen, this can lead to situations where GitHub is required to remove code, even if it has a multitude of non-infringing uses, if it is in fact designed to circumvent a TPM, technological protection measure. But this is exceedingly rare. Less than 2% of the DMCA takedowns we process are based on circumvention claims, and of those 2%, this was a particularly unusual case. DMCA takedown claims based on circumvention are a growing industry-wide issue for developers with far-reaching implications. We'll get into this with more detail, but first, here's some quick background. And, and here's some quick background of my own. Yes, it's true that GitHub has a law that they should obey, but the DMCA is optional. You do not have to obey the DMCA. The reason why GitHub obeys DMCA takedowns is because if they don't, they can be held liable. So if they are wrong about YouTube DL, they could be taken to court for the full liability of YouTube DL's copyright infringement, or at least some kind of contributory or vicarious liability based on hosting the YouTube DL project. So if they obey the DMCA takedown notice, then the law gives them immunity from liability. So it is a little self-serving for GitHub to do that, but if you received a DMCA takedown and you weren't sure whether what the content you were hosting was a violation of copyright law, given that the minimum damages are $750 per infringement and the maximum damages are $150,000 per infringement, you might pause too and decide to obey that part of the law but it is optional. Circumvention claims. Most takedown notices we receive allege copyright infringement, that someone used their copyrighted work, often source code, in a way that infringes their rights. But as many people noticed, the YouTube DL takedown notice fell into a more unusual category, anti-circumvention, an, al an allegation that the code was designed to circumvent technological measures that control access or copying of copyrighted material in violation of section 1201 of the DMCA. Section 1201 dates back to the late 1990s and did not anticipate the various implications it has for software today. Oh boy, do I know that one. Every day I'm talking to clients about how the DMCA and copyright damages were set by law and don't have, they didn't have any idea back then what the internet would be. There, there was some, for, some forethought, and so the founding fathers of the DMCA did some things right, but there's some things that need to be tailored too but that's not for this stream. Well, they're gonna go over it. As a result, Section 1201 makes it illegal to use or distribute technology, including source code, that bypasses technical measures that control access or copying of copyrighted works, even if that technology can be used in a way that would not be copyright infringement. Circumvention was the core claim in the YouTube DL takedown. GitHub's developer-focused approach to the DMCA. GitHub handles DMCA claims to maximize protections for developers, and we designed our DMCA takedown policy with developers in mind. Nearly every platform with user-generated content accepts then processes DMCA takedown notices to comply with the law. For GitHub, many of those notices come from developers wanting us to enforce the terms of their open source licenses. For example, when someone is using their code without the proper attribution required by the open source license they adopted. Here are the ways our approach protects developers. Given the cost of two developers, given the cost to developers of unwarranted takedown of code, we ensure we have a complete notice before we can take action. So they make sure that they have an entire complete DMCA takedown notice and not something less. 
We distinguish between code that merely can be used in an infringing way and code that is pre-configured to be used a certain way. We also recognize that code can provide access to copyrighted content without violating the law, for example, fair use. In some cases, we can keep a project up because the content identified in the takedown notice is not, in fact, infringing or circumventing a TPM that controls access or copying of copyrighted works. Our process sets a higher bar for 1201 claims than the infringement claims. We require complainants to provide additional information specific to circumvention and to describe the technological measures and how the project is designed to circumvent them for us to consider a notice complete. Below, we explain how we're further strengthening, strengthening our process. Whenever we process takedowns, we notify all the affected repository owners about the takedown and give them options to dispute it. We allow the repository owner to make changes to address the allegations in the notice, and in many cases, we can keep projects up because they do. We are transparent with the developer community about DMCA takedown notices. Every time we process a DMCA takedown notice or counter notice, we publish the text to our DMCA repository, dated on the date we process it, as opposed to when we receive it, so that anyone can see the notice and the basis for our action. These are all steps we currently take to help developers which go beyond our legal obligations and typical industry practice while still meeting the requirements of the DMCA. Go enjoy playing your Doom CJ. I, I like that game too. YouTube DL. As we explained, the key claim in the YouTube DL takedown is circumvention. Although we did initially take the project down, we understand that just because code can be used to access copyrighted works doesn't mean it can't also be used to access works in non-infringing ways. We also understood that this project's code has many legitimate purposes, including changing playback speeds for accessibility, Okay, preserving evidence in the fight for human rights, great, aiding journalists in fact-checking, and downloading Creative Commons licensed or public domain videos. When we see it is possible to modify a project to remove allegedly infringing content, we give the owners a chance to fix problems before we take content down. If not, they can always respond to the notification, disabling the repository, and offer to make changes, or file a counter notice. And that's one of the things I wanted to add here. I don't see anything in here about a counter notice coming from the EFF or coming from the YouTube DL repository owners. Maybe they did send a, uh, a takedown, or, or yeah, maybe they did send a takedown. Maybe they did send a counter notice to the takedown, uh, but I don't see anything about it in here. So it seems like, without knowing anything about that part, it seems like this was restored against the RIAA's wishes and without the protection of the safe harbor of the DMCA. So that really means that GitHub is going to bat for the developer. That's what happened in this case. First, we were able to reinstate a fork of the YouTube DL after one of the fork owners applied a patch with changes in response to the notice. Then after we received new information that showed, let me see what this, what this link is. Ha ha ha, guess what it is? It's, it's the EFF's letter. So that's, that's, that's what it is. It's in response to the EFF's letter. After we received new information that showed the YouTube DL project does not, in fact, violate the DMCA's anti-circumvention prohibitions, we concluded that the allegations did not establish a violation of the law. In addition, the maintainer submitted a patch to the project addressing the allegations of infringement based on unit tests referencing copyrighted videos. So the, the two things put together, the letter from the EFF plus the willingness of the uh, project hosts or project creators, project maintainers, we were able to, they were able to uh, change the unit tests so that they no longer referenced the RIAA's music on YouTube, which was basically the only foundation the RIAA had to send that. Um, it's really interesting that the music industry is being so aggressive lately. I'm, I'm really not sure what the continued motivation of the music industry is to enforce all these things. It's it's almost like they just don't like their favorite customers very much. I'm, I'm not really sure that their profits go up that much when they're able to take down YouTube DL. Can Is there like some guy in a suit, like in an RIAA conference room going like, look at all the profits we just generated by taking down YouTube DL. I don't, I don't see it. 
um, I've attended some of these talks from various industry leaders and yeah, there's some issues with piracy, hence the pirate hat, uh, but the ways to combat piracy are more like removing obstacles for purchasing and obtaining things legally, um, making sure that prices are set in a way that the people who want to buy something can buy it, making sure it's available. And yeah, when there's a new game or a new album released, having some DRM, some strong DRM in place for at least the first few weeks so that people who want to buy it have to buy a legal copy and cannot just get it uh, on, on BitTorrent, for example, or something like that. In addition, the maintainer submitted a patch to the project addressing the unit tests. Based on all of this, we reinstated the YouTube DL project and will be providing options for reinstatement of all of its forks. What we're changing. Going forward, we are overhauling our 1201 claim review process to ensure that the following steps are completed before any takedown claim is processed. Every single credible 1201 takedown claim will be reviewed by technical experts, including, when appropriate, independent specialists retained by GitHub to ensure that the project actually circumvents a technical protection measure as described in the claim. Two, the claim will also be carefully scrutinized by legal experts to ensure that unwarranted claims or claims that extend beyond the boundaries of the DMCA are rejected. In the case where the claim is ambiguous, we will err on the side of the developer and leave up the repository unless there is clear evidence of illegal circumvention. In the event that the claim is found to be complete, legal, and technically legitimate by our experts, we will contact the repository owner and give them a chance to respond to the claim or make changes to the repo to avoid a takedown. And if they don't respond, we will attempt to contact the repository owner again before taking any further steps. Only once these steps have been completed will a repository be taken down. After our repository is taken down due to what appears to be a valid and legitimate 1201 claim, we will continue to reach out to the repository owner if they have not already responded to us in order to provide them with the opportunity to address the claim and restore the repository. Even after a repository has been taken down due to what appears to be a valid claim, we will ensure the repository owners can export their issues and PRs and other repository data that do not contain the alleged circumvention code where legally possible. Thank you, Robert, for the $5. Did you see when the exploited bug was used to attach YouTube DL to the DMCA repo? Yeah, that was really funny. Just to explain, there's a, there was a bug that allows repos to be attached to other repos. So you sort of, something about a fork, and then if you fork it, and, and you, know, you can fork your way back in. So the, repo, the repository on GitHub for the DMCA notices kind of like the Lumen database for Google, um, but the repository for the DMCA notices then contained the YouTube DL code. That was, that was really funny. We will staff our trust and safety frontline team to respond to developer tickets in such cases as a top priority so that we can ensure that claims are resolved quickly and repositories are promptly reinstated once claims have been resolved. All of this will be done at our own cost and at no cost to the developers who use GitHub. We believe this represents the gold standard in developer first 1201 claims handling. Like we do with all of our site policies, we will document and open source this process so that other companies that host code or packages can build it as well. And we will continue to refine and improve this process as our experience with these types of cases inevitably grows. And then here's the part that I was really excited about. I think it's really cool when companies put their money where their mouth is. They're, they're establishing a developer defense fund. Developers who are personally affected by a takedown notice or other legal claim rely on nonprofits like the Software Freedom Law Center and the Electronic Frontier Foundation to provide them with legal advice and support in the event that they face an IP claim under the DMCA or otherwise. These organizations provide critical legal support to developers who would otherwise be on their own, facing off against giant corporations or consortia. The RIAA is, of course, an association, so a consortia. 
Nonetheless, developers who want to push back against unwarranted takedowns may face the risk of taking on personal liability and legal defense costs. In, in the law, we call this the access to justice problem, and it's a major, major problem. People who have legitimate claims often can't pursue them because the barriers to entry, simply just hiring a lawyer, is often very expensive. Even this lawyer, even when I get hired, I have to charge something. I have student loans. I have to eat. I have bills. I have taxes. I have a wife. I'd like to have a family someday. I'd like to buy a house. So we all have these basic expenses if we just want to have a living wage, basically. And there is no right to a free legal help. There is there is no guarantee that the lawyer gets paid and the innocent person gets a free anything in civil law. And this is civil law. So it's an access to justice problem. To help them, GitHub will establish and donate $1 million to a developer defense fund to help protect open source developers on GitHub from unwarranted DMCA Section 1201 takedown claims. And you have to be careful with this. I don't know if you remember that there was a FUPA fund, a fair use protection something from H3H3. And even if you have a million dollars in there, how many hours of attorney's time is that? I mean, I guess I guess let's just do a quick calculation. If I put 1,000 thousands, as Joe Bluth likes to say it, into my calculator here and divide it by, let's say, oh, $325 an hour, that's only 3,000 hours of attorney's time before you've run out of money. So that's, you might not necessarily be able to, to defend more than uh, anywhere from about uh, 15 to 100 cases. Hopefully there aren't that many, um, but it's a good start. I'm certainly not talking down about it. I'm just also letting you know, like, that's a lot of money, but it depends on how many cases there are. And this is why they can't just defend every single case. Sometimes you can only defend the meritorious cases, but a million dollars is not a small amount of money either. I'm not minimizing it. We will immediately begin working with other members of the community to set up this fund and take other measures to collectively protect developers and safeguard developer collaboration. If you want to support developers facing legal challenges, you can consider supporting the SFLC and the EFF yourself as well. How we're working to improve the law, no matter what we do to protect developer rights, we must still work within the boundaries of the law and the DMCA's current boundaries are hurting developers. One way to address the problems with the DMCA is to work to improve the law itself and to prevent even worse laws from being enacted around the world. We were successful in a multi-year effort to stop the EU Copyright Directive from mandating upload filters for software development, and we're taking lessons from that fight to the U.S. as broader DMCA reform begins to be discussed. We are also advocating specifically on the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA to promote developers' freedom to build socially beneficial tools like YouTube DL. Right now, the U.S. Copyright Office is conducting its eighth triennial review process of exemptions or exceptions to the anti-circumvention provisions of the of Section 1201. Um, what this is is the Copyright Office, the Register of Copyrights, and the Library of Congress, Librarian of Congress, are tasked every three years with creating exceptions to the anti-circumvention provisions. One of the most famous is jailbreaking your phone. Are you allowed to jailbreak your phone so that you can put your own apps onto your phone? Yes, you are under current copyright law. Not the written law itself, but rather the law that says you have exceptions created by the Librarian of Congress. So that law, which is law, but that law is how you get jailbreaking your phone, or working on your John Deere tractor under some circumstances, or getting fair uses of YouTube videos or DVDs or Blu-rays because of journalism or education. Those things are often protected by this, this exception created by the Librarian of Congress. It's, it's a very long document, so I'm not going to go into it here. It'd be too much, but uh, that's something you can look up with the Register of Copyrights or the Librarian of Congress DMCA exceptions. We will be saying more about that soon, but if you 
But if you believe, like we do, that the DMCA is overly restrictive in its anti-circumvention preventions provisions and want to change that, you can contact the Copyright Office. So you can you can lobby the Copyright Office by using the contact form, um, I'm guessing, on the Copyright Office's website. We'll take a look. This is the, okay, so this is the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Oh, okay, it's actually already up. And so you can submit written comments and there's a, a comment form. I guess one is short and one is long. Oh, one is, yeah, this is a, this is a Word document, the long one, and the form is probably online. We will have more to say about how you can join the fight to make copyright law more developer friendly soon. Stay tuned. So great. Uh, so that's, that's, that's it. The, um, you can donate to the Software Freedom Law Center. It relies on your donations to fund our work on behalf of free and open source software developers. Please consider donating. And you can buy EFF gear and donate your time or just have a membership, donate your car, donate stock, donate networking hardware, donate airline miles. Hmm, I have some airline miles that I'm not using right now. I wonder if that actually helps. I have a, I have a feeling that doesn't help so much when there's really nobody traveling by air. But uh, yeah, so then here's the, I wonder what the notice of proposed rulemaking looks like that I just said I'm not going to go over. This PDF form, the filling of forms is not, in, okay, it's fine. Just zoom in for me. So by the way, we're not gonna go over this, but when you go through this, it is, it is obviously in three columns. It's very dense text. You're looking for the headings um, and you're looking for the proposed rulemaking. So unlocking computer programs is one of them. Repair of motorized land vehicles is here in the middle. You're looking for these headings. Security research, if I can highlight things. Uh, repair of smartphones, home appliances, and home systems. So these are all proposed reasons why you can circumvent technological protection measures. Software preservation. And read the fine print carefully here because some of this is only for libraries, archives, and museums, not for general use. So this is not for the archival and playing of Nintendo ROMs. This is for preservation by libraries, archives, and museums in that particular case. So when you go through and read that, you can then decide if you want to make a comment. And those comments are supposed to be reviewed and taken into account by your government, who's supposed to be governing the people. Of course, we saw how well that worked with net neutrality when the vast majority of comments were for net neutrality, but the JITPAI uh, and the administration of the FCC still killed net neutrality. Maybe we'll get that back someday, but. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you for joining me. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education program here on YouTube. We're also on Twitch and Floatplane, and you can join us and help support more videos on our channel by donating to us via patreon.com slash ljfrench, sponsus.com slash law. You can become a YouTube member and you can join us on Floatplane. You do not need to do all four. Those are just your options. So thank you very much to our current November supporters at the $50 level, monthly $50 plus level, Joe Tyson, Wes Delge, Citizen of the Sovereign, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Spirit Bear, Andy, Benjamin Hytoff, Goliath Cleric, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Rudolph Bescherer Jr., Oscar the Prophet, Jay Dixon, Hot Grills in Your Area, Brandon Abel, Torpedon, Cassandra Curran, Mayor of Titty City, Shadow Tycho, RDH Dragon, Earthbound Star, and No Copyright Violation Intended. And apparently, yes, apparently something I said triggered Google because that killed my, <laughs> my uh, uh, LED panel in the background running on my tablet. So thank you very much for joining me. I think we're at about 45 minutes. So let's, let's end it there. And that way everyone can have a... Uh, a video that we can we can watch and it's not like a three hour live stream i'll leave that up on the channel and everybody could view that so yeah i think that's 
a lot of, uh, of good stuff that's happening. And thank goodness that the EFF got involved. Thank goodness that GitHub is fighting for developers and not just caving to the music industry that is upset that people download YouTube videos. I mean, that's a stretch, right? Like that was really stretching it really thin. Like, okay, well, some RIAA music is on YouTube. Here's a tool that lets you download YouTube videos. So therefore the tool can be used to download music that's on YouTube. So that means we have to stop everybody from downloading videos. Yeah, I think that's ridiculous. But hey, that's the music industry for you. I don't know what to tell you. What, are we all going to listen to music that's not paid for by the RIAA? I mean, yeah, there's lots of good independent music out there, but you also do want to listen to the new music that does come from the music industry. So it's it's just more like maybe they could find better messaging and maybe they could endorse better policies and find ways to make money without shutting down other legitimate projects. That's, that's, that's my take from this. That's my hot take on this, is that the RIAA has overreached, that they are trying to shut down legitimate tools. I don't think there's, I don't think there's, I think the YouTube DL problem is far removed from the piracy of the RIAA's music. I think the Twitch DMCA issue is maybe a little less far removed, a little bit closer to the heart of what copyright should be protecting. That people playing music in the background like they're a radio station, not not like they're a radio station broadcasting music, but like they have a quality show and then they want to put good music underneath their quality show while they're playing games or streaming their content online. Yeah, you should be paying for that music on some level. So what the RIAA should be doing is using their technology, using their prominence in the industry to create a new revenue stream saying, okay, everybody who wants to stream the you know top music, the RIAA's music on Twitch can do so by buying this license something like that. And in, instead, I don't think that license is really even available in a blanket form. But I don't know. Um, maybe that's something we'll see in the future. It would be, I think, highly beneficial and would, would make a lot of people hate on the RIAA and the other music industry representatives a lot less. Anyway, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I'm going to let you go. Have a great one. Bye.